Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Robots and Empire by Isaac Asimov. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I will share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Daniil has the finest mind in history. Giscard can adjust human emotions. Can two conscience-stricken robots save the galaxy? Madame Gladia Solaria glanced disdainfully at the barbarous settler from Bailey World who had disturbed her long middle age on Aurora. Yet something about him intrigued her. Perhaps because both he and his planet were named after Elijah Bailey, the short-lived Earthman who'd been her lover two centuries before. Those memories plagued her. She knew she must return with the settler to the deserted planet of her birth, Solaria. But the robots Daniil and Giscard knew more. They too remembered Elijah Bailey. Now they must prevent his old enemies from plunging the galaxy into war if the first law of robotics will let them. Dun dun dun. So, I didn't get too many tabs in this because to be honest, I wasn't particularly interested in it. So, I'm not the biggest fan of the Empire or the Foundation books. I do like the robot stories, but I tend to prefer the short stories just because it's the concepts and the way that Asimov sets up the laws of robotics and then breaks them, that's what I really enjoy. And there's just less room for it in a novel. So this was just like a really bloated short story, I guess. And this is uh, potentially what we could expect in our future, I guess. It says, uh, there were no locks on any doors. There did not have to be. There was no violent crime of any sort on Aurora, either against human beings or against property. There could not be anything of the sort since every establishment, every human being was, at all times, guarded by robots. This was well known and taken for granted. The price for such calm was that the robot guards had to be always in place. They were never used, but only because they were always there. And this is interesting because you get the difference between like, groups, I think one's the spacers and the others are like the Earthmen or whatever, and they have different lifespans, so we get, there are plenty of available planets still, millions, and if they can do it, of course they can do it, said Mandamus with sudden passion. It costs lives, but what are lives to them? The loss of a decade or so, that's all, and there are billions of them. If a million or so die in the process of colonising, who notices, who cares? They don't. I'm sure they do. Nonsense. Our lives are longer and therefore more valuable, and we are naturally more careful with them. Just an interesting thought that perhaps if you lived longer, you'd be more likely to be concerned about your own life, I guess. Might, that might explain as well why in history a lot of these like barbarous civilizations where people have lifespans of like 30, they don't tend to mind as much going to war and shit. I don't know. We get a few references throughout to, what is it called? I can't remember what it's called now. The, the technique that uh, gets developed to predict human, uh, like human behavior. Psycho, psycho history, we get a few references to that. It's dropped by name later on, but towards the beginning we just get like a passing reference to it. And again, we get another reference to the difference here between um, the longevity, so. And I'm gonna read this out as well, because there's a bit of a note about population uh, that says there are eight billion Earth people, which is the number we're currently on, or we were on last time I checked, there might be more now. We were taught in school that it was six billion, but it's gone up a lot since then. You have scarcely given the spaces a chance to like them. Earth people are beginning to set on new planets, even rude and unformed ones, and they do it without robotic help. You know very well the differences between Earth people and ourselves. There are eight billion Earth people, plus a large number of settlers. And there are five and a half billion spacers. Numbers are not the sole difference, said Amadero bitterly. They breed like insects. They do not. Earth's population has been fairly stable for centuries. The potential is there. If they put all their heart into emigration, they can easily produce 160 million new bodies each year, and that number will rise as the new worlds fill up. We have the biological capability of producing 100 million new bodies each year, but not the sociological capability. We are long lived. We do not wish ourselves replaced so quickly. We can send a large portion of the new bodies to other worlds. They won't go. We value our bodies, which are strong, healthy, and capable of surviving in strength and health for nearly 40 decades. Earthmen can place no value on bodies that wear out in less than 10 decades and that are riddled with disease and degeneration even over that short period of time. It doesn't matter to them if they send out millions a year to certain misery and probable death. In fact, even the victims needn't fear misery and death, but what else do they have on Earth? The Earth people who emigrate are fleeing from their pestilential world, knowing that any change can scarcely be for the worse. We, on the other hand, value our well-wrought and comfortable planets and would not likely give them up. And we get this because, uh, because of the longer life, they. Um, you know, they're worried about germs and stuff, and this just is very COVID-y. Um, I presume, she said, he's been in appropriate quarantine before being allowed to land. It would be inconceivable for him to not have been, madam. She said, just the same, or wear my gloves and my nose filter. 
and I just thought this was about right. It says, uh, nothing she knew could bring back associations in the way that odours could. Not sights, not sounds. And that's certainly true for me, I think. I think like smell tends to be the more powerful sense, especially for setting off like nostalgia. And then uh, Gladius, she says here, would you like me to make a speech and tell them exactly what 40 decades means? Shall I tell them for how many years one outlives the springtime of hope, to say nothing of friends and acquaintances? Shall I tell them of the meaninglessness of children and family, the endless comings and goings of one husband after another, of the misty blurring of the informal matings between and alongside, of the coming of the time when you've seen all you want to see, and heard all you want to hear, and find it impossible to think a new thought, of how you forget what excitement and discovery are all about, and learn each year how much more intense boredom can become. We get a reference to the Caves of Steel as well, which is another Asimov novel, and indeed we go into the Caves of Steel later on, and another sort of covid reference. Gladia adjusted her nose plugs nervously. She had never before been in the presence of large crowds of short-lived human beings. Short-lived in part, she knew, or had always been told, because they carried in their bodies chronic infections and hordes of parasites. She whispered, will I get back my own coverall? You will wear no one else's, said DG. They will be kept safe and radiation sterilized. And then here we get like, a lot of the outrage that people have, if you refuse to shake their hands these days, they, they, they go like, oh, are you saying I'm unclean? It's like, no, mate, I'm just doing my bit for public health. Plus, handshakes suck anyway. Uh, they are the spoken advertisements of her hypocrisy. She moans and whines about her inadequate immune system and says that she must protect herself against the danger of infection. Of course, she doesn't do this because she thinks we are foul and diseased. That thought, I suppose, never occurs to her. My friend got chased out of a pub because he refused to shake someone's hand the other day. And he has a compromised immune system, so it's like, he has a good reason to not shake your hand. And another note on that as well. A thousand people milled about and an endless succession of them came up to speak to Gladia. The word had apparently gone out not to offer to shake hands, but some inevitably did. And trying not to hesitate, Gladia would briefly place two fingers on the hand and then withdraw them. I wouldn't even do that. So yeah, that's about all I have to share from Robots and Empire. Um, as I say, normally in the Robots books, there's a lot of really cool stuff about the three laws of robotics, but there was some stuff on it here, but not a huge amount. I think mostly I enjoyed like the comparisons to COVID and also the, contrast, uh, the contrasting of the different uh, lifespans of the spaces and the Earth people. Um, but overall, uh, I gave it a strong, but three out of five. And I mean, I'm glad I ticked it off, but um, I don't know if I'd necessarily recommend it. I mean, sure, if you're going through all the Asimov books, but uh, don't go out of your way to it. Uh, definitely read something like iRobot beforehand, because iRobot, just, yeah, that's good. My favorite short story collection. This, I could take it or leave it. So there we have it. That's what I made of Robots and Empire by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.